Jetzt mischen wir YouTube. Okay. Okay, then welcome everyone to our weekly colloquium of the Physics Institute of the UNAM in Cuernavaca in Mexico. Our guest today is Professor Joao Milton Pereira from the Universidad Federal do Ceará in Brazil. And yeah, let me say some, some few words on the vitae of um, Professor Pereira. So he did his PhD at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Then he made postdocs at the Universidad Federal do Ceará in Brazil and at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And um, since 2009, he is a professor at the Universidad Federal do Ceará. Um, from 2014 to 2015, he was also a visiting researcher at the Radboud University in the Netherlands. And yeah, his research interests are in low dimensional system, magnetic thin films, semiconductor nanostructures and surface plasmons. So Joao, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, for joining us today remotely via Zoom. Um, we would have enjoyed it very much to have you here in person. Uh, okay. Hope so the next time. Yeah, and we're looking forward to your talk. Hey, thank you. And thanks again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to, uh, th this title is very general, right? There's a, a lot of, uh, can, that can be said in ballistic transport in 2D materials, but uh, what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on some on, uh, a couple of problems that we have worked on our group. And the, the, the thing that connects this work is the fact that you can make uh, an analogy between the uh, optics and electric trans and electronic transport in these systems. And from that, you can actually draw inspiration from optics to propose new devices based on graphene or other 2D materials. And then, um, so I'm going to talk about, but first I'm going to do some brief introduction and then uh, talk about the electron optics in graphene. And I, I'm aware that uh, it's something that uh, you, your group is, is quite interested in, in working on. And uh, one of the things that are, I'm going to mention is the, the possibility of the control of the phase of the carriers in graphene. And also, uh, there's a, a one particular work I'm going to mention is uh, one that we used uh, the, the effect of a, a Fezalago lens in graphene to propose a device that would allow the control of current in graphene, like a transistor. And finally, there's this work we did on wave packet propagation in phosphorine, which, uh, which is another 2D material, which has become quite uh, uh, popular lately in the last seven years and uh, although the, the, it's the last topic it's actually the, the there's the most materials on, on that neck and I'm not sure actually if I have time to talk all about everything related to the phosphorine case but uh, let's see but first of all let me say a few words about uh, my hometown so I live in Fortaleza Fortaleza is if, as you can see in the map here is on, on the northeast coast of Brazil this is divided in five regions, roughly, and this is the, 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 the northeast region of Brazil. And uh, for this, has about uh, three million inhabitants, and and we are just three degrees south of the equator. So we have this nice tropical weather all year long, and the state of Ceará is famous for its beaches, and people from all over the country go there to, to visit. And here is a picture of the physics department at UFC. And in our group, we have this uh, condensate matter theory group there, um, the GTMC, Group de Teoria da Matéria Condensada. And uh, currently, we have uh, we, uh, there are now uh, seven professors there: uh, Professor Gil Farias, Professor Raimundo Costa, Professor André Chaves, Professor Vandenberg, Paiva, Professor Jean Lex, and Professor Diego. And we mostly work on condensate matter, but there are other subjects that we explore too. In particular, uh, Professor Van der, Van der Berg, he works mainly on soft matter. He studies colloids. And Professor Jean Lex works on, on condensate matter, but also on biophysics. Now has a lab 
uh, not related to the GTMC, but uh, a lab that uh, we study the mechanical properties of cell membranes. It's very interesting work. And uh, and then uh, we, um, uh, of Jules uh, Farias worked mainly on semiconductors, graphene and plasmons. And uh, we study mainly uh, transport and uh, excitations in these materials, such as plasmons and uh, excitons, which are an specialty of Professor Andre, and also magnetic properties. Me, with, together with Professor Raimundo, we do some work in that. And uh, nowadays, we have about 23 graduate students working there, but it, this number fluctuates and three postdocs and a number of uh, undergraduate students with robotics. So we are very active nowadays. And years ago, when I would talk about graphene, uh, I would have to make, first make a, an introduction and, and describing what is graphene. But nowadays graphene has become so well known that uh, I just make a brief mention of the properties of graphene. And uh, as, this picture shows that it's the, the electron bands close to the Fermi level in graphene. And uh, as you can see, uh, around the Fermi level at corresponds to zero energy, here we have this uh, cones at the K and K prime points in the bench in, in the brilliant zone. And that means that uh, the, the dispersion of the, of the electrons in graphene or electrons in holes is approximately linear and so they behave like uh, Dirac fermions with zero mass uh, with a light speed as uh, that's like um, approximately, approximately C over 300. So it has the electrons in graphene has a they have a series of interesting properties and among them they don't have a gap in the spectrum and they also they are chiral right as a chirality. And that leads to some interesting phenomena like the Klein tunneling and also uh, the negative refraction index and other effects that are, are, are not relevant to what I'm going to say next. But um, the Klein tunneling is the perfect transmission through a potential barrier in graphene, right? And it has to do with the absence of the gap, but also with the fact that the, the gaps, the, the electrons are, are chiral. And this is a picture from this uh, famous paper by uh, Michel Katz Nelson where they illustrate the effect of the Klein tunneling. That means that uh, the, the, every potential barrier in graphene is transpar transparent for electrons that are incident normally, perpendicular incidence. And that uh, means that there is a problem there if we want to make a, lo a logic circuit with graphene, in the sense that we, if you make a, a logic device, it does not have a, an off state, because you always have current flowing. So one of the challenges of uh, develop, developing devices based on graphene is uh, how to control the current, how to turn off the system, right? So there, was, there were several uh, works that were done on that, and they, they tried to address that problem. And another aspect of the propagation of electrons and holes in graphene is this uh, negative refraction effect. That means that uh, when the electron it enters in a region of a different potential, say in a p-n junction here, so we have uh, say zero potential on the left side and a certain v on the right side, uh, you have a refraction effect. But this refraction uh, met, uh, corresponds to to what would happen if you have uh, an optical system with a negative refraction index. And that led some people, uh, in this case, this is a paper, the original paper by uh, Shayanov, uh, Falco, and Oshula. Uh, they, they show that you can actually uh, imagine that you could make a kind of lens using these potentials. So it's called a, a Desalago lens, that they, it makes use of this negative refraction to focus the, the electrons, the electron beam, right? And one thing that we are we were interested, in, and we always try to see what people have not done already, in that. and and since there was such a, a flood of papers on graphene, it's sometimes it's hard to find something new to say about that. Uh, 
uh, some people even say that graphene is kind of um, outmoded because people have done everything they could on graphene, so people are moving towards other materials, right? But now you have new results, like we have a uh, twisted graphene by layers, which kind of renewed the interest in graphene. But one thing that uh, caught my attention years ago was the fact that, well, that's it's true that the electron it crosses the barrier with uh, zero reflection if you have normal incidence on a uh, potential barrier. However, uh, this electron, the, the phase of this electron is shifted. Right? That's not uh, unexpected. If you have a, a, a usual uh, Schrodinger equation with a potential barrier, and you send an electron with, a, with an energy higher than the, the barrier height, you have a phase shift that, that's expected. But what's interesting here is that this phase, it's uh, independent of the energy of the electron. And also, uh, it doesn't matter if the electron has energy higher or lower than the barrier. And it's very easy to calculate this, this phase shift. And it's basically, it's proportional to the height and the width of the barrier. So if you have, if you look at this integral here, uh, if the barrier is uh, square, like this one here, you have basically v, Vw in this, in this phase here. So we decided to check what, uh, how could you use that to manipulate the propagation of electrons in the system. It's more of a proof of principle than anything. And, and this is the first time where we use this optical analogy because uh, there are systems that are, uh, where you have optical modulators where you use exactly the same effect. You have a system where you can modulate the phase of, the, of uh, a laser, right? And by by causing a time-dependent phase change, uh, this phase change will act like an extra frequency. So we decided to check that. So uh, in short, we had uh, the perfect transmission to the Klein due to Klein tunneling. The phase is independent of the energy. That also means that if you send a wave packet through the barrier. Uh, all the components of the wave packet will be, will be equally shifted, right? So uh, if you have a time-dependent barrier, you, you have a phase that depends on time too. So say, if you assume a, a linear dependence of the potential, right, like this one here. I took this from the paper we published. Uh, if you have a, a, a linear dependence on the barrier height and you put this in the phase expression, you have something like this. And as you can see, you have uh, minus i times something times time. And this will act like an extra energy in the system. That uh, suggests, suggests to us that you could actually shift the energy of the electrons by an amount that was dependent on the, the rate of change of the potential. So we, just, we decided to check that. And uh, to do that, we use this uh, this method called an numerical method called the split operator method. We basically we send uh, with a Gaussian wave packet through this, this structure, and the method is a way to calculate the time evolution operator in the system. And as you can see, that the system has a, a no uniform potential, so you have to be very careful when calculate the time evolution operator. And this method is a way to to get a good approximation for it. Uh, as you as you can see here in this expression, it's it's a it's, it's a, uh, in the paper you can see a, a longer description of that. But uh, you separate the the kinetic energy part from the potential part this way, and when you apply this to your wave function, uh, you switch from uh, position dependence to momentum dependence by making a fast Fourier transform. Of that. I'm not going to go into all these numerical details, but and this is a way to obtain like a film of the propagation and also to measure the energies. And, and this is the, one of the results. So this is a, a energy as function of time, right? So at a certain point, a certain time, the wave packet will interact with the barrier and the barrier is shifting the height of the time. So it starts here with 100 million electron volts and each curve corresponds to a different rate of change of the height. Uh, originally, I was thinking about using a, a, a sine dependence. I decided that it was simpler to simply uh, use a linear dependence. So 
So we have this simply simple uh, alpha, which is uh, in milli electrovolts per femtosecond. And as you can see here, that's exactly what happens. See, it starts with 100 electron volts. There's a complicated uh, dependence on the time here. But afterwards, after it departs the barrier, uh, see, when the rate is positive, the energy is increased. Right? And when the rate is negative, the energy is decreased. This for it is for different widths now of the of the barrier. And you can see we have this very simple relation for the phase and the relation between the phase and the energy. But uh, as we will show, the numerical result matches perfectly the, the prediction of that formula. So and, and it's shown here, it's a bit messy, but this is the energy as function of alpha of this rate of uh, change of, of the barrier uh, for different widths of the barrier. And as you can see, there's a very nice linear relation between the, the energy shift and the, ra the rate of uh, variation of temperature, of, sorry, of, uh, of potential. And the same, same thing for uh, different widths, right? When you change the width, also there's a linear dependence. Uh, Professor Andre had the very interesting idea of uh, checking what happens if you put a magnetic field uh, behind the barrier. And as you can see, the energy can go from positive to negative here, right? That means that you are actually transforming an electron into a hole in the system. As it crosses the barrier, it, it converts into a hole. And uh, so we put a magnetic field over here to to measure the, the electro hole character of the of the transmitted state and they all start as, as electrons but as you can see here for some, in some cases it, they, they they bend in a different direction so it's, they act like holes so this is what was, was published uh, a few years ago in 2015 and uh, this also with one of our students uh, gabriel and so it's more of a proof of proof of principle there's there's also there's actually one thing that we are uh, not quite, quite happy. I mean, the result is correct, but not quite happy yet with this, this work is the fact that we used, uh, as you can imagine, we used uh, an empty band. So we had an electron, but we had no other electrons there. So we still don't know what happens if you have a semi-field band there. Because if you, if you consider this case here, there could be a uh, poly blocking uh, happening here, but, but we, we haven't considered that. Actually, we are not working on that anymore, but uh, that's it have to be something nice to check, right? And that's one example of, uh, of optics giving uh, an insp inspiration for for the electronic world. And another another problem that we consider that concerning the phase, this manipulation of the phase was uh in retrospect it's a it's a very obvious application of that is we considered a, a max zender interferometer right again there, there's a very uh direct analogy between this and optical systems where you have uh, a max zender uh, op, uh, fiber optics and you have a, a phase modulator in one of the arms of the max zender and so you have, as you can see, you have now three barriers. Actually, my original idea was having one barrier. And then uh, Professor Andre suggested putting two more here. And the point is, using that, uh, you can imagine that you can actually create a logic gate for that, right? Not only a logic gate, but a configurable logic gate. And um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we have these three widths and three three potentials here, A, B, and C, right? And each one will give a, will give a contribution for the phase given by, by this expression. And from the previous work, we know that actually it's a very good approximation of what we actually get there. We, uh, it's interesting because uh, I first thought about this uh, about, um, about 2006, right? But at that time, there was no uh, software, like no software package that we could use to do this quickly, to assemble the system and calculate and everything and, and do the calculation of the, the 
conductors. But since then, there, there were some developments. There was a development that uh, quant Python package that uh, makes it very easy to do this kind of things. So we have uh, these three. First of all, we consider just one, one of the barriers to see if we can actually introduce, by changing the phase, you can actually create a, a destructive interference on the outgoing lead. So this was built using quant. There's, there's an uh, inbound uh, lead. There's an outbound lead over here on the, on the right. And you have this uh, uh, armchair edges on the side here of this hexagon. Mm -hmm. We chose an hexagon because we want to avoid the effects of the, of the edges. Right? If you have zigzag edges, you have localized states, and you want to avoid, avoid problems with that. So we want to see if we could, by changing the voltage here, if you could uh, uh, create a destructive interference on the outgoing edge or the uh, lead. And that's exactly what happened. Actually, I was kind of surprised that it worked so well because this is the result. And by there's actually volts, right? And this is the conductance. And you can see, you can actually, that is at, at zero temperature, right? Go, make it go to zero. This is for different widths of the, of the barrier. And this is actually at 77K. And so you can actually turn on and off the, the current. That means that you can actually have a transistor. We, we didn't, in the paper, we didn't call it transistor. We were afraid people would complain of that, but it's a transistor effect. And, um, and you want to check what, that, what else you could do with that. And so another thing that we started to check that formula for the phase and the Oh yeah, this, this one here. And this, the, the, the red one, the red curve is the analytical formula, that simple formula. That, it's a product of the width and the height divided by H bar VF. And the dots are the numerical population, right? So there's a very good agreement with that. And, but we want to see if that's, that would also happen if you had a, a usual uh, Schrodinger like system. And one, one way of doing that was using, instead of, instead of using a honeycomb lattice, using a square lattice. So uh, we did that calculation. Actually, there was this was performed by my PhD student, uh, Duarte José, right? And uh, we checked that. So the blue lines are for the square lattice, and the red line is for graphene. And as you can see, you can you, you don't have a strong effect with uh, the square lattice, but for graphene you have a very strong effect. We uh, in the paper we quote the the on-off ratio for that, and um, it's interesting that the the referee of the paper I think it was an engineer because he, he asked us for about some uh, uh, merit figures for that, so we had to go and search uh, for that and. So we, we, we compared our, our on-off ratio with the with, for usual device, and it was pretty good. The referee said it wasn't so good, but we, we actually compared to what we see in the literature, it was pretty good. And yeah, so this, this work was done, it was part of the, the PhD thesis of my student, Duarte José. And uh, since then, he, he finished his PhD and we started a collaboration with Professor Tony Lowe in the University of Minnesota. And Tony was looking for a PhD, a new PhD student. He had had a scholarship for that. He asked me if I, want, I, I had someone that I could uh, indicate for that. I said, oh, I had no one because they are all finishing. But then I talked with Duarte and he said, okay, I'll do another PhD. So he's now in Minnesota working, pursuing an, a second PhD on uh, Electrical engineering with Professor Tony. He did some other work I'm going to show you. And then uh, a more recent work, uh, still in this uh, analogy between optics and electronics, was uh, uh, a very simple device that uh, exploits another analogy. And this one has to do with this, this technique called uh, Schlitten imaging. And this is a very nice uh, uh, technique for showing very tiny variations on the refraction index uh, in a gas, right? 
And the, the picture here is quite small, but what it has here, we have a camera and we have a light source, LED here. The light source shines over a spherical mirror and the spherical mirror focuses the light on the camera. But on the focus, there is a, a knife edge. This knife edge, it blocks part of the light. So what happens is that when you have a tiny variation on the refraction index, that means that part of the, the rays will be deflected towards the, the knife, so it will be blocked. And in, if, you, if the deflection is in the other direction, they will be deflected away from the edge, so it will be brighter. So this tiny variation in the refraction index will translate into this uh, contrasting images here. So th this is a recent picture of someone coughing front of this device, right? And, uh, and it shows the, the turbulence on the air, in the air that the person coughs, right? So the idea is, if you have something similar with electrons in graphene, so suppose you have, you could focus the electro, uh, electrons in graphene, can you do this kind of manipulation? Because that would be a way of uh, applying very weak electric or magnetic fields to to control the current okay, by blocking or unblocking the, the, the current. So we decided to check. I asked my student uh, Ona to do that. And uh, so this is the device. So here we have basically a, a PN junction. And as I mentioned before, with a PN junction, you can have uh, this Vesalago lens effect. So you have a focus somewhere here on the right side. And the the system that uh, we that he built on this uh, quant, it has four leads. We have this incoming lead on the left. There's the outgoing lead on the right. But we have also this uh, up and down leads here. And what the idea is, we have this uh, vessel lens here. By the way, that would be uh, for a certain energy of the elect of the instant electrons, but that's something that can be adjusted by, by adjusting also the, the, the gate voltage in this region, in principle, right? So, in such a way that you, you, the focus is on the outgoing lead. So the electrons come from the left, they are focused on the right lead. Then the idea is that we apply an, uh, an in-plane electric field or uh, perpendicular magnetic field to cause a deflection of this, this rays. And that will move the focus away from the, the lead. Then the electrons will be scattered towards the uh, leads three and leads two, up, away from the, the detector, right? So this is a picture obtained from quant. It shows the current and this panel A shows the, the system without uh, uh, electric or magnetic fields. And you guys, you can see that there's a nice focusing effect here on the right side. Okay. Then you apply a magnetic field. And it, as you can see, there's a deflection, some deflection. So 0 0.2 Tesla and 0 0.4 Tesla have a very nice deflection here. Then on D and E, you have an electric field. So you have a deflection upwards here. 0 0.25 millivolts per nanometer, and then 0 0.5 millivolts per nanometer. <clears throat> Again, the effect was even uh, stronger than I, I expected. As you see, the other figure here. So this is the conductance. Okay, it's for a, a system with a width of 50 nanometers. Then you have also uh, the blue is 50 nanometers. Then you have 100 nanometers and 150 nanometers. It's interesting that the, the effect becomes stronger as you increase the width of the system, right? Which is nice because we want something that can, can be robust, can be uh, easier to make. And as you can see, as you as you apply the electric field, you have uh, this strong drop in the conductance. Okay, both in the case of the electric field and in the case of the magnetic field. Okay. I think I forgot to add the reference to the paper. Let me see here. Oh, it's here, it's here. Yeah, we published that uh, uh, last year. Okay. 
So again, this analogy can, uh, this analogy with optics can inspire some some new uh, devices, electronic device, right? So that's the the moral story. So moving on to phosphorine. So in 2014, uh, people have uh, obtained this uh, monolayers of this uh, outer top of, of phosphorus. See, the black phosphorus is the most stable uh, allotrop of phosphorus uh, that's stable in room temperature and room pressure. And uh, using, people can use uh, uh, macromechanical cleavage, for instance, to, to obtain single layers or bilayers of phosphorus. So people became interested on, on that material because it has a, a higher um, electromobility than the TMDs. And also it has a gap in contrast with graphene. Graphene doesn't have a gap. So it becomes a uh, focus of uh, very intense uh, research. So these are some, some experimental results that show the structure of phosphorine. So we have the side view of the layers here. And as you can see here, it, it has some similarity with graphene in terms of structure, except that we have this, what we call this puckered uh, structure that goes up and down. That means that uh, the the structure of um, the crystal structure of phosphor of phosphorine with a single layer of black phosphorus, it has uh, four sublattices. Okay. Then uh, I'm going to omit some some of these slides here. So it, as you can see here, we have uh, uh, the the range of gaps for black phosphorus is is wider than for the TMDs because. This is considering also the, the different number of layers. As you change the number of layers, you change the gap, right? And people have actually been able to, to already make devices. This from a paper from 2014, right? That use uh, black phosphorus. The bench structure of, of black phosphorus is shown here. The, the black lines, they were obtained from uh, uh, GW calculation, and the red ones are actually a tight binding model that was developed. But as you can see here, the uh, the close to the gamma point, right? The spectra is dominated by the PZ orbitals, so you can actually develop a tight binding model that operates only on the on the PZ orbitals, and this was developed by uh, Rudenko and Katz Nelson in 2014. I'm not going to go into details, but this is a, a tight binding model that they used. Right? And you can get very, a very good agreement with the GW calculations. The gap is about, uh, it's close to two electron volts, that system. And here's a comparison between the GW and the tight binding calculations. Right? The GW is the, the red ones, and the blue ones are the tight binding. So it's a two bond, two two band actually. Actually, it's a four band uh, model, but it can be reduced to uh, a two band model. Uh, one thing I did when I was in uh, in the Netherlands was to start from this tight binding model and obtain a continuum model. In the same way that you start from a tight binding model from graphene for graphene, and you can obtain a Dirac equation from that by expanding the Hamiltonian around the K, K, prime point, K prime points. You can do the same for, for phosphorine, but expanding around the gamma point. So, uh, by the way, you can also uh, exploit the symmetry of the system. Just make, say a few words about that. Um, you see, you have this four sublaxis. So in principle, you're, if you use a one orbital for your tight binding model, you have a uh, four band model, you have obtained four bands. But, you, you, you can use the symmetry of the system in the absence of a perpendicular electric field. You can exploit the symmetry and reduce that to a two band model. So using that, you can find a continuum model for that, phosphorine. Again, I'm not going to go into many details, but as you can see here, if you compare with the case of graphene, in graphene you have this uh, diagonal terms are zero. And on the off diagonal terms, you have 
linear functions of kx and ky, right? So in this case, we have both linear and quadratic dependencies on kx and ky. Right? That means that uh, uh, it, it has, some people say that it, it, this system has a Schrodinger-like behavior on one direction and uh, Dirac-like behavior on the other direction, in the perpendicular direction. Uh, just one thing also, uh, in this paper, we actually, the, the convention used for X and Y, I later realized was switched between what is usually found in literature. In the literature usually we have KX here and then it's K, and then it's KY, right? but it but makes no difference. But you can make, uh, compare that with the tight binding model and it matches very nicely. Okay. So, and from that continuum model, you can obtain uh, an effective mass model. So you can find effective masses. And the interesting thing, one important thing about the phosphorin is that it has this anisotropy. As you can see here, if you go in uh, the y direction, you have a one curvature for the band. For the other direction, you have a different curvature. And that means that the, the masses in the x and y directions will be different. Okay, And you can uh, obtain a, an effective Hamiltonian like this. So it's the, the simplest model you can have for this kind of system. Um, and you can start from that and obtain the Landau levels. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and you can also obtain the case for the bilayers. And in the, it's interesting the case of bilayers is that now you have four, four bands close to the Fermi level, right? And uh, you have a gap in the system. But if you apply an electric field, see, in the case of uh, a well-known case of bilayers is graphene bilayers. And a graphene bilayer of a base statin, it has no gap. And if you apply an electric field, you can open the gap. In the, uh, in the case of phosphorine, it's the opposite. You have a zero gap, or two, sorry, you have a gap. But if you apply, apply an electric field, you can, eventually you can uh, close this gap. And it's shown here. This is uh, the gap. You see, the energy at the gamma point of the two bands. And for uh, high enough uh, uh, potential, you can actually close the gap. What happens afterwards is that you create two direct points, right? In this region here. As you can see, this, the, these are the Landau levels. You have these Landau levels that are equally, equally spaced here, that are typical from the Schrodinger case. But as you close the gap, they become like graphene level levels, right? Anyway, uh, one thing we did afterwards uh, was we uh, generalized that for uh, a multi-layer phosphorin. And this uh, work that done by Duarte José uh, Luan, another PhD student of mine, Professor Diego Costa, and Professor Tony Lowe also. So we, we extended that model for uh, an arbitrary number of layers. The nice thing is that we can now obtain the effective masses for each subband associated with different numbers of layers. Okay. So it was a very nice calculation that uh, we did, and um, the, the, the students did actually. And um, let me just skip to the results. Mm. Okay, so. Now we can, what we can do is we can obtain effective Hamiltonians for each subband for this multilayer system. And the, the, different, the difference now is that you have an, a, a sort of effective potential that depends on the layer index here. Okay. And, and we, using that, you can actually obtain a reasonable approximation for the, the bands for uh, monolayer, bilayer, trilayer, tri and tetralayer. Uh, the, the approximation is the, the red lines here. The tight binding calculations are the blue ones. And the effective masses, they match the numerical calculations. So this is the gap. It's a function of the number of layers. And um, here there are effective masses for different number of layers for electrons and holes. The, the, the nice thing about this is that using this, uh, this effective masses, all that calculation using quant 
or wave packet propagation can be extended for an arbitrary number of layers using these effective Hamlet rules. Then we also studied the number ribbons, um, but I'm going to skip that. Because um, what I want to focus is the wave packet propagation. So, as I said, having these Hamiltonians for the, the effective Hamiltonians for the single layer, by layer, three layer, etc., you can study the wave packet propagation in the systems and in and model devices, for instance, if you want. And uh, that can be done also analytically. But for without the uh, scatterers, for instance, otherwise it becomes too complicated. But um, uh, as a starting point, you can can consider the system without any any uh, no uniform, no uniformity in it. So it's possible to do a knowledge calculation. That's uh, uh, you can start from this paper here by uh, Maximova et al. Right? A paper from 2008. And uh, well, I'm going to. I'm not going to bore you all about this calculations here. But you can obtain the, the position dependence, the, the time dependence of the position of the uh, center of mass of the wave packets as function of time. That it's the, these calculations are useful because you can use them to uh, to test your numerical uh, code to see if it uh, agrees with the analytics, right? Kind of benchmark. Then, for the numerical approach, again we used the type, the split operator technique. This was a work done by my student uh, Sofia Cunha. She's a, a PhD student, and uh, she basically used that method that was mentioned before, but with the uh, phosphorine Hamiltonian. Okay, and we were we were, we were able to obtain the effect to observe the effect of the zip of the vagon in the system right the, the trembling motion of the wave packet uh in phosphorine and and the, again this system it shows the the strong anisotropy of the system in this this dif different uh, trembling motions depending on the direction of propagation right? so that's something we investigated that that, that does not have a direct uh, optical analogy, but it's uh, it, it it has some bearing on what I'm going to say next. So this is the Sophia's work. But what I really want to show is the <clears throat> the use of this wave pack, wave packet uh, dynamics to study the scattering of electrons in uh, brain boundaries in phosphorine. Right? These pictures they are experimental results. Or that show show the, the existence of grain boundaries in graphene. So we have uh, graphene along, uh, oriented along one direction on this side here, on the left, or on another direction on the right side. And in the interface, you have these uh, heptagons and, and, uh, and pentagons, right, at the interface. It's like stone waves defect here. Okay? And they can scatter electrons. So you have this crystallography. Uh, crystal domains here uh, in different directions in graphene, and they can scatter the state. So we wanted to, to, to see what would happen if we had something similar in black phosphorus, phosphorine. But for that, we use that uh, that uh, simplest model, the effective mass model, to study the propagation of wave packets in the system. Uh, in that case, the Hamiltonian uh, is, it's, uh, I had shown it before here, but let me show you again. Um, here. See, this is the, the Hamiltonian, which is the energy of the system. So we have this uh, kinetic energy here from, with the effective mass in the x direction, and you have the kinetic energy with the effective mass in the y direction, right? But uh, that, is I'm defining the x and y directions uh, parallel to the anisotropy axis of the system. But you can define the axis in different directions. What would happen is that uh, your effective mass tensor will not be diagonal, but you have off diagonal terms. And that's exactly what happens here. And the reason why we did that is because 
we are going to consider <clears throat> different orientations of the lattices in different regions, right? So you have this uh, mu x, mu y, and mu x y. So these are inverse uh, effective mass tensor components, and it can be they can be found from these expressions here based on m x and m y. And alpha is the angle between the your coordinate systems and and the anisotropy axis. So you have an anisotropy axis here, and you have your 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 uh, x and y axis with, with angle alpha. And if you look in this, uh, uh, if you take a, a constant energy curve for the system, it could be an ellipse. ellipse. And the system we are interested in investigating is this one. So we have two regions, one and two, and they have different orientations, right? They are described by these angles, alpha one and alpha two. <clears throat> and the constant energy surface uh, curves in momentum space are these two ellipses here. But you see, there is no difference there. There's no uh, potential difference in, in the whole area. here. It's all phosphorine. The, the thing is, one important feature of the system is that the the velocity is not collinear with uh, the momentum, right? As you can see over here. Uh, so you have this state here. The, the velocity will be the gradient of this curve, right? So uh, they are not collinear, right? And the, the so there is a possibility when you have this interface, going to have possibility of refraction or even total reflection. Right? Uh, we check that. So this is a, like a incidence angle uh, versus a refraction angle. Um, but that's not actually so interesting. It is more interesting is this one here. So these two, on, on the left, you have these two ellipses that correspond to the two different regions. And as you can see, the energy is the same. In both cases, the energy is the same. But suppose we start with this black uh, arrow, black vector here corresponding to the incident, incident momentum. And you have this velocity here, V1. As the, the electron interacts with the, the interface, see the momentum in the direction parallel to the interface is conserved, right? That means that whatever new state you, you get on the other region, it must conserve the KY. It must, be, it must have the same projection on the y direction. So uh, one state that matches that is this blue one here, K2. But as you can see, the uh, K2 has the same energy, but the velocity is in a different direction. That's why you have refraction. Uh, another situation is when you have, say, this state K1 here on the right side. Uh, it happens that in this case, this, this is actually normal. It's perpendicular to the interface because the, the V is say, along KX, right? V is along the Y, the X direction. But as you can see, there is no state on the blue uh, ellipses that uh, satisfies both the energy and KY conservation. So that that's why you must have total reflection. That. You can even calculate, uh, obtain the, the new velocity, new direction by extend this line to this point here. So the new, the new velocity will be, of the, the reflected state will be like this, right? It will be no, no specular reflection. And we, what we did, uh, uh, actually it was a, uh, one of my master's students, uh, Luis Felix, that did this calculation. He, he uh, shot several wave packets. The interface of this vertical line here. So he shot several wave packets, and he saw the trajectories of the, the center of, centers of mass of the different uh, wave packets for different orientations, different angles, right? And you can see in some cases, for instance, in this one here, you can see that there is a total reflection, right? Some refractions and total reflection. And you can also make movies of that. So these are two snapshots of the of the wave packet. So this would be the classical trajectory of the wave packet. 
classical, not in the sense that uh, it should be like an electron in vacuum, but uh, 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 if you use um, geometric optics in this system, in this case, you have to be the trajectory. So the classical in this, in this sense. Uh, so it should go this way. So we have this interaction here with the interface. And there is no reflection in this case. It's completely transmitted, right? But with a shifting velocity. And uh, finally, in this case here, he shot the swift packet. This would be the, the, the expected trajectory. But then you have total reflection. And a kind of, a kind of ghost hunting effect here. You have uh, some shift of the wave packet. So this is actually a work, uh, this is something we are preparing to, to be published, this result here. And uh, and there are other things that we, uh, one of the things that we also want to explore on that is to, to put two interfaces. So we can actually have some, some waveguide for the system here. Something similar was actually done for graphene years ago. Well, so uh, as I kind of, uh, showed, uh, this, anal this uh, analogy between optics and electronics in these 2D materials can, can be very fruitful, can, can find some very interesting uh, things that can get illustrate that uh, analogy, right? And uh, I love the opinion that uh, uh, all the research that we do, it uh, it must be uh, of uh, academic interest, uh, scientific interest, and also probably with uh, uh, some utility that might be useful. But I I believe also the, the the work should be fun, and I think this work was quite fun. So these are the students that participated in that work. It's uh, Eduardo José, Eduardo Vieira. They all they defended the PhDs already. That's uh, Sofia, Gabriel. Maybe Felix, Franz Adaf, and Gisele de Sons, right? And so with this, uh, I'd like to thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to Thank you very much, Joao. Thank you very much for this very nice, very clear, very interesting talk. And um, yeah, are there comments, questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question, if it is possible, Thomas. Yes, Parisa, go ahead. First, I thanks uh, from this nice talk. Uh, I have uh, really several questions. One of them is that uh, in one of your slides, you showed the uh, wave packet dynamic and the expectation value of the effect. If you yes. can show it, please. You know, I think it's uh, the, the analytical calculation, right? Yes, yes. It was a yeah. figure which you show the expectation value of the grid for the first This point. one here? But no, 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 it was the figure. A figure? Ah, uh, okay. Um, it was a phosphorine? Uh, okay. this, this last one? This one? Uh, I don't know. It has an oscillation part and uh, some uh, constant part. I have a question about that. <clears throat> Because uh, this oscillation part uh, from the expectation value of Y, uh, not, no, not this one, another one, uh, but maybe. Uh, I think it was, is it the Bavagun, right? This one here? Oh, yes, yes, this one, thank okay. you. Here, uh, if you look at the first figure uh, in the uh, left hand, you can see an oscillation in the uh -huh. effect, uh, expectation value of Y. This oscillation is the vestige of the we're going. For phosphorin, as you told, we have a Schrodin, uh, Schrodinger part in Hamiltonian and also a Dirac part. It seems that as the time passed, uh, the, the, the Schrodinger part will be became more important because the oscillations disappear. Uh, yes. I don't, is it correct? Yes, yes. These, uh, uh, these are like uh, transient oscillations, right? And by the way, that's also, that also happens with graphene. Um, uh, I didn't, I haven't shown all the details on that, but when you when you calculate that, let me see if I have I have it here. No, I don't. Oh yeah, because I, I, I didn't show the details. But as you can see here in the caption, it says C one equals one and C two equals I, right? So you have your state is actually this. Uh, 
is spinor, right? And there is a, a phase relation between them. So this oscillation happens because of that, right? But it actually, it's, uh, it dampens with time. That's one thing that we observe. It, it depends also this, this this damping depends on the momentum. So, okay. uh, actually, I, I actually forgot to include. There is there is a very recent because I, I was in a bit of a hurry, but I I forgot to include a recent work by Sophia that shows something similar, but a, a different kind of zeta value. Um, yes, I think this uh, this oscillating uh, part will disappear by a term of one over uh, a square root of t. So maybe I don't know. It is this effect, or the Schrodinger part will be more important after the time passing. I don't. Uh, well, for that, I probably would have to check the calculations. See okay. that, right. because uh, as you can see, this is all numerical. So uh, you have to to like uh, go into the under the hood and really check the which part becomes more important than the other. Right? <laughs> Another question is that uh, for the first slide, you speak about the time dependent potential. And yes. uh, on that part, you uh, compare the time dependent potential with the Mach center. Uh, I think in the time uh, uh, time periodic potent time uh, time potentials, uh, I think I have we have not uh, we have local uh, conservation energy, not conservation energy, and then you compare uh, this uh, local conservation energy system with the uh, conserved energy system, which is Machender. I, I don't know if it is a, a, a possible way to compare them or not. Uh, you see, uh, in this one, the, the barriers are static. They, they don't have no time dependence. So you have energy conservation in this, in this case here, right? But uh, in the previous case, you don't. Uh, there is actually, there's one work that we are about to submit to publication, uh, where we consider a system like this, but with magnetic field. And what we can, what happens is that this uh, barrier here acts like a, the phase. Actually, it's like you are changing the the circumference of the of the wind in some sense, right? So you can actually uh, change the the if you if you have a time varying uh, uh, gate there, you can actually induce a, a current in that system if you have a magnetic field. But in this in this particular problem here, the the barrier is static. There's no time dependence. Hey, thank you. And the last question is that for the phosphorus, you have uh, you introduced the effective mass mu x and mu y. Is there any condition that mu x will be equal to mu y? Um, well, you see, uh, these effective masses they they are really they depend on the hoping parameters in the tight binding model, which themselves depend on the uh, the overlaps between the, the Ponyer functions in the, the structure, right? So it's you can you can vary the effective masses by by change by changing the number of layers or or maybe applying strain in that system. But uh, in the case we are considering, I have some figures here for the masses, by the way, let me show you here. I showed very quickly uh, here. So as you can see, this is for different number of layers. So you, you change the effective masses, but the masses are still different. So oh, okay. the upper ones are, are for electrons, the, the, low, the, the ones below are for poles. They are, they are always different. But yeah, I believe I that the, if you apply strain, uh, I might be mistaken, by the way, but I, I think if you apply strain, you can find a way to equalize them. Somehow. Okay, okay. Thank you so much for uh, answering. Yeah. Uh, the, the result, uh, by the way, I, if, if you allow me, I might show you some, so just one more result, if I can find it. Um, it's, it's a fierce paper. Because I was going to include it here, and in the end, I forgot to include it. Um, 
let's see here. So, but you have to change the window which you are sharing. Yes, this uh, we okay. see only the. Uh, or you copy the photo in the um, open office document. Ah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll do the, the following. I'm going to, to paste it in the, in the yeah. open office. Um, let me see here. Okay. But it, it's like this. The idea is that we consider that effect. Uh, oh, I cannot. I cannot see it. I just see yeah. the same figure yeah, of. Yes, it's open here. Open here. Um, let's see here. Okay. Can I, how can, can I share the, the another another window? Yeah, you have to click again on share screen, the green button below. Then you uh, can. Okay. I'll do the following. I'm going to send you the paper. Right? Yes, but, please. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, we we uh, what we did we considered a, 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 a quantum wire, mm -hmm. in, in it's phosphorine, but we 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 misaligned the wire with the, the anisotropy axis, right? Okay, and I see. Wave packets there. So what we found was that uh, in some cases uh, you can have uh, uh, the velocity along of the wave packet along the the wire actually has uh, an oscillation as well. It has okay. to do those, those ellipses. Right? But I can send you the paper if you want. Okay. Yeah, please do so, yes. I would be interested. Are there further questions, comments from the audience? Uh, sorry, I have another question about uh, this uh, slide again. Uh, sorry, uh, do you think if we uh, we apply a spin orbit coupling, uh, we may have the uh, uh, we may have the mu x equal to mu y, or only by applying a strain we have this condition. We can have this condition. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I heard uh, the first part of the question. If you ap apply uh, some other perturbation to the system? Yes, yes, yes. Spin orbit coupling was the question. Uh, Ah, oh, spin orbit. No, the spin orbit won't change much. Actually, I, I know because I did that calculation. And what spin orbit would do, it will um, it will cause a small split in the, the bands. But it's a it's a quite small split in the bands. And uh, yeah, but it won't change the effective masses. It will still be another another problem. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your answer. Okay, I have some questions to all. Um, in the part where you have this time-dependent barrier, um, did you try to stop the wave packet? Because you have this, yes, you, you show the, um, when you have these um, time-dependent potentials, the energy of the effective energy of the electrons is changing. So the group velocity will change. And when you have zero energy, the group velocity should be zero, right? Uh, well, this is graphene, right? So the, you have the Fermi velocity in that case, right? Uh, well, maybe if you have a, a gap, uh, say, uh, by interaction with a substrate or, okay, you're... or with spin orbit, even, right? But uh, nothing. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They will... Just the Fermi wavelengths will be. Um, increasing right when you when you go to zero to zero energy yeah what i suspect will happen is that if you lower the energy uh below the the fermi energy there will be a reflection the uh a power blocking uh we just didn't try to include that mm -hmm. in, the, in the calculation probably becomes a, a well much more complicated problem Okay, okay, I see. In, in one of these figures, you showed that you take into account a finer temperature. I think it was with this Mach Zender interferometer yes. where you compared with Schrodinger square lattice. How did you take into account your temperature? Uh, well, we used uh, Landau and Butcher formalism for that. 
and it enters in the uh, Fermi Dirac. And just Fermi Dirac distribution. Yeah. So there are no, there's no modeling of phonons or decoherence. No. Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah. We always assume that uh, you you have uh, the, the phase coherence length is larger than the yeah. device. And there is no phonon scattering and no that, that is scattering. So that's why I said it's mostly a proof of principle. Mm. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, yeah. Are there further questions, comments from the audience? Yeah, can I make a question? Yes, of course, Emmanuel. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's about the, the backsender interferometer. Um, yeah, I, I see in your in your results in your uh, you 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 put or you, you consider always the the width of the of the C the C barrier uh, greater than the, the the width of the of the nano ribbon. In, in, yeah. in, in the in the calculations, uh, is that uh, is that a condition to 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 use this this system to like a like a, a logical gate? Not really. Or, or, um, we one thing we if you start increasing the width of the ring, what will happen mm -hmm. is that you have more modes. Uh, with I mean with uh, the the this W here, right? If yeah. you start increasing W, uh, you start having more modes, and the effect would be uh, as visible in that case. Uh, but still, uh, it, it, we, one thing we considered was uh, I didn't mention before, is that we use the uh, tight binding model right, for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the referee asked uh, if you if you had a larger system because the developer always complained that the system was too small. But we we used uh, kind of rescaling. There's a way of mm -hmm. obtaining an effective tight body, tight body model for a larger system from mm -hmm. that one, and the, the effect persisted. So it's not okay. really that dependent. Okay. <clears throat> you see, uh, oh. this, this effect, we are always assuming that the electron is uh, normal, to incident normal to the barrier. But uh, since you have a very restricted geometry, that's mm -hmm. more or more or less guaranteed that you have a, a ribbon inside. Okay. Okay, okay. The real problem okay. in this system is the effect of edges and defects. Okay. Okay, okay thanks. The next up. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, are there further questions? Uh, I have I have one further question to the regarding to the wave packages which you propagate through the system. Do you know um, how to realize or how to implement such packages in the experiment? Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, I get the same questions. <laughs> uh, not really, but we can imagine, right? Um, because what you have really is some very, very short pulse of electrons, right? So you have a, if you have a very a very small current flowing in the system, then that could be could maybe realize this kind of wave packet propagation, right? You have a narrow a narrow uh, lead and a, a small current, so basically you could have this wave packet. Okay, yeah, I agree, but um, it's not that easy. You need to. Um, engineer somehow um, narrow leads precisely to uh, things. This is the main problem, to inject this ballistic, very narrow um, electron beams um, to compare with, with electron optics. But we all know there are experiments which show um, uh, the Klein tunneling and negative reflection. So it is possible, but it's not, I think it's not, not simple or easy. Um, Professor Diego Rabel showed this work on the, the interferometer uh, at uh, in, the, in the United States. So we went there. Mm -hmm. I think he talked with some people from IBM, and they they said, no, 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 we're not interested because these things are too too hard to make, and we prefer silicon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah this. Um... Okay. 
I heard the same the same stories. You know that yeah, the engineers they know how to manipulate silicon and how to deal with it, and yeah, still yeah. the microprocessors which they, which we buy every day for computers they are based on silicon. So. Yeah. And, and about the, the black phosphorus, uh, there is one thing that I, I didn't mention is that it initially when it was produced, it tends to, it tends to degrade in the, in, in the atmosphere, right? So uh, I saw one guy that works with, uh, closely to the industry and he said, oh, we don't, we don't care about black phosphorus because it's too reactive. But do you know if... Them. Uh, yeah. Do you know if this is if this has been solved meanwhile by enclosing or encapsulating the material? I saw some papers work with uh, encapsulation, mm. but uh, it, that's it's it's hard to to say that the, the industry will adopt. They go always to by the easiest route, right? Mm. It's cheaper and, and more well known. It's yeah. it has to be a game changer. Uh, it has to be orders of magnitude better than everything what we have right now to convince the industry, I think, to um, to make efforts to to change the material. There is another question in the chat. Uh, Ronan is asking, could the interference effect on the quantum ring be achieved using just one barrier instead of three? Why use all three? No, no. Uh, actually, it's one, one, one barrier is enough. The idea of having three there is because of the, the logic gate, the idea of the logic gate. Because if by, by fixing two potentials and like fixing one potential and vary the other two, you can uh, implement the, uh, uh, because in the paper we talk about that. Uh, and or XOR not, all these, these logic gates can be implemented there. It's just a, a matter of playing with these voltages here. But one, for this effect, one is enough. Okay. Yeah. Are there further questions, comments? Yeah, if this is not the case, then we thank you again, Joao. It was a very nice talk. Thank you for joining us today, virtually, via Zoom. And we'll yeah, keep in contact. We keep in contact. Hope to see you the next time in person. Yeah. Right. Bye bye. See you.